Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. This is the eighth and final session of Evolution of the Arts in a Digital World Symposium. I'm Allison Kenny Gardhouse, Vice President of Music and Engagement at the Francis Winspear Center for Music and the Edmonton Symphony Orchestra. We want to give a thanks to the Canada Council and the Arts Digital Strategy Fund. They, the funding they've provided has helped make it possible to offer this uh, session at no charge. We would be happy if you would be considering a donation to help with our costs as well. And there is a donation page in our chat. We also would like to thank Arup for their support. On to our session today, Expanding Our Horizons, Innovation, Transformation, and the Future. So the future of our organizations depends on our ability to adapt to the new world we live in. We all have questions and we want to know what's next, what's possible, and how do we continue making good art in our world? Our guest speaker today is gonna to help us with that. Annette Mies is an award-winning artist and immersive theater director. She is the head of audience labs at the Royal Opera House, which is dedicated to exploring the artistic possibilities of immersive technology. She understands that digital art is about expanding the industry, not replacing what we already have. I know that through the considerable experience of um, Annette's work, she will be able to guide and help us understand what some of the challenges are and what some of the possibilities are. Please note that we will have a question and answer period near the end of the presentation. So please put any pres uh, questions you have for Annette into the chat and we will address them then. Welcome, Annette, and I'm going to turn the presentation over to you. Hello, and thank you for inviting me, Alison. It's, um, it's a joy to be here. Um, I will be sharing my screen um, and showing you some slides uh, just to help guide. As Alison said, um, I think part of the joys of, of digital connections is that it's all about dialogue. So please, so I will be really happy to answer questions and to, um, to just have a conversation about what this all means for you. So what I'll start with is just talking through my approach and my work, but always like to uh, precede that with that's my approach. And there's so many approaches possible. As Alison says, for me, this is all about expanding, what art and culture can be and who can make art, art and culture and how and where we encounter it. It's about expansion rather than replacement. So there are a multitude of met methods for that. I'm gonna share my screen, give me one moment. So here we go. Um, just gonna make this smaller. Uh, so, as Alison said, I'm the head of audience labs at the Royal Opera House, and um, we are dedicated to exploring how you make great art using digital technology. Uh, I joined the Opera House in 2018, so it's a, it's a relatively recent addition. Um, Exciting. There we go. Um, so just a little bit of background. So the Royal Opera House is in London. It's been there for ages. Obviously, it's gone through lots of incarnations. Um, and uh, a, a few years ago, about six years ago now, um, they started a new capital project called Open Up. The Royal Opera House proper old building. Um, and it was really set up for performance only. And when our current CEO, Alex Beard came in, he wanted to open up the building during the daytime and um, literally open it up to audiences at different times of day and in different ways. So the, uh, the glass uh, frontage you see here is new. 
we refurbished the, um, the Limbury Theatre, but also brought in a, a bar and a place and made it really easy for the building to become part of the fabric of Covent Garden where it's situated. This was, uh, this is a big ambition for the Opera House to become more trans, almost literally become more transparent. At that point, um, the organization also really had a, a long and deep conversation about um, what it also philosophically means to open up the organization and these art forms, opera and ballet. Um, they are by many seen as something distant, something that maybe they see once in their lives or, or, or not at all. So, the organization at that point started looking at technology. Technology as a way to open up the building, the art forms, to open up to new technologies, to new audiences, to new ways of working. So that's really where I came in, that ambition to open up. And I think that is still at the heart of everything that I do and really at the heart of what the Opera House's mission is. So, so Audience Labs, when I came in to establish it, I wanted to really create a space where artists could meet technology companies to create boundary-breaking contemporary opera and ballet experiences. So for me, in this sentence, there are a couple of things to pull out. So one is the idea that it's about artists first and technology second, but it's really a place for meeting is for these two to come together and to really push both the artistry and the technology to do something very new and something that feels of the now. Um, it's about opera and ballet. It's about creating great art. It's not about tech demos. It's not about using technology for technology's sake. It's about creating great art. So, these are sort of the four pillars that I've put into place that we really focus on. And as we go through it, we'll see that we prioritize different things at different times. Um, but these four are always present in some way, shape or form. So first of all, top left, new art forms and voices. So as we already touched upon, I think that uh, technology is an expansion of the stage. It, um, the thing the Audience Labs doesn't do, and which the Opera House does do, but, but it's outside of my realm, is broadcasting pre-existing work. It's, it's a whole thing, and we can talk about that as well, but it's not really what my department has focused on. We're really looking at, if you make an original work that works really well within the digital sphere, what is that? So I often talk about technology not so much as a tool or as a broadcasting device, or as a distribution device, but really as a stage. And just as certain pieces of work work on small space stages, some work on big stages, if you want to adapt a play to a cinema, then you have to create something for it. Um, so if you make new kinds of art, you, you really engage with formal experimentation, like what, what worked, what kind of music, what kind of experience, how do people connect to it? These things also really allow you to think about how you make art. And that makes it really easy to really think about who makes art as well. And that's what I mean with the voices there. Um, within Audience Labs, because it works differently, um, because the sort of creation processes are up for grabs, because the creative teams um, are expanded with different um, expertises, thinking about diversity and inclusion is become second nature. It's something that you can work, rather than having to change something, you can just feed it in. So diversity and inclusion has become really important to who we make art with. So the second pillar is then new partners and processes. So if you make new forms and you want to attract new, for, new voices and work with new kinds of voices, you immediately look at new kinds of partnerships because you want different expertises to become part of it. So we work with technology companies from small, amazing technology magicians uh, like Figment, who we'll come to later, which is a, just a local 
SME in London to we've, we've done some work with Google, but also we're working with we're working internationally, we're working um, with uh, with lots of different partners to make this. And as you work with these partners, you have to re-examine your processes. They have their process, you have your process. How does that come together in a way? How do you create a vocabulary and understanding between people with different expertises, different backgrounds? So process and the experience of process and how you create process is very much part of this. Um, the th third pillar is where does it go? So for me, what's really exciting about this work is that yes, you can do work on stages and we have and will, and we'll get to that. But also it opens up a way of creating work that meets people where they already are, that can tour, that can travel, that can pop up or reaches you from your phone. Um, how do we think about sort of the fabric of digital experience as a, a way to not only bring audiences in our within our four walls, but also how does it allow us to break outside of our four walls? How does it activate a front of house? How does it spill onto the street? How does it pop up for you on your morning commute? Or how does it pop up in um, your local market square? All of that becomes a lot more possible. Again, theatres were built to be the perfect house for performance. The spaces have, have developed to uh, house the art form. With digital, we have all these new spaces and stages and possibilities of staging, which really allows us to think about places and audiences in new ways. So rather than having to invite people in, you can reach out in very new ways, which is very exciting. And again, it allows you to really think differently about what you make for who you make it. And, who do you want to be in dialogue with? Who do you want to connect with? What are the stories? What are the things you want to um, do together? It's all about, I think digital has a real capability of gathering, of bringing people together. Um, I was really, uh, really intrigued by the description of the rusty mu um, musicians that we listened to in the intro. It's a very different way of bringing people together and, and those sort of possibilities open up in new ways when using digital. And then finally, which is as important uh, as the other three exploratory uh, things is what are, what, is, what are the business models that underpin this? Especially in the digital sphere, business models are super new. Um, we have seen the rise of the giants, obviously, and the monetization of data, but that's maybe not where we want to sit. There is, um, a lot of investment that is there for innovation and how does culture respond to that? How does it want to be part of it? How does it not want to be part of it? There is um, There are new philanthropists now. A lot of people have made their money in innovation, have a love for culture, and would be very interested in working with culture in organizations to explore how digital transformation uh, what this transformation looks like for culture, but also how culture um, contributes to digital spaces and digital culture. So I think there's, I think quite often the first response to digital is to try and figure out how the, to make the audience pay for it. But we all know that our, our models are more complex than that. Um, we rely on public money, we rely on private money, we rely on audiences, we rely on, on friends and supporters. And I think trying to figure out how to make different mixtures of investment and money and exploitation work within this sphere is a whole work package in its own right. But there is a lot of opportunity. So there's a lot of opportunity for new art because everything is still starting. There's a lot of opportunity for new partners because we are culture and it's, we're a very attractive partner for technology companies, for you know, everyone is, technology is inventing often the platforms, which I would call the stages, but it isn't always sure how to make amazing experiences on it. And that's what we're good at. There's a real opportunity in the spaces, the places just breaking out of our geographical model 
we have a building somewhere and we want people to come to it. And there is uh, an opportunity with uh, new business models that underpin that and new money we can attract so that we don't cannibalize what we're already doing, but really expanding what we can also do and how further we can become part of, you know, the fabric of society and daily life and, and part of the lives of our audiences. So what I've been doing with this, because it is all very new, there are a lot of people that pretend to know what's going on and really nobody knows. It's fresh, it's new. We're at the start of figuring out what's important. So within the audience labs, we have set it up to be at the forefront. I call it experimentation with purpose. So we look at all those four dimensions. We experiment with form and with artistry. We really think about how do we make our artists, great artists in these new spaces? How do we develop new voices that can resonate with different audiences? How do we experiment with money, with partners, but in a way that is always geared towards great art? So experimentation itself is a practice, and we all know to a certain extent what that looks like. Rehearsals are experimentation with purpose. It's experimentation to hit the perfect purest form. Um, I steal a lot from different design models, different experimentation models. You'll see some on the right. Iterative design is really important to me, which just means that rather than starting with the end point in mind, you do little experiments that you grow into something that is great. Um, there are lots of different models and I think there is a lot for us to learn as we experiment from different disciplines. So I'm just going to talk through a series of projects that we've done and again these are just examples and they're just different ways of thinking about it. I think the most important task for every arts organisation is to consider what their role might be in this space, what they want to focus on, whether that's a multitude of things or singular things. Um, I think our role is to figure out what we want to do and don't want to do within the digital space. It's not going to go away. It's, it's occupied by brands and shops and Hollywood and government and charities. So you can choose to ignore it, which is a perfectly valid thing to do, but do so by having a deep think about it and trying to figure out why it's a very strong thing to, to discard digital in the 21st century. So that almost becomes a, a brand choice. So the next slides, I'm just going to talk through some of the experiments we do, the experiments with purpose, um, and just using some, um, some projects as an example of the kinds of exploration we've been doing. So artistic exploration for me is at the heart of everything. My background is as a theatre director, I'm an artist, and for the Royal Opera House to set up an artist-led um, department was, was, you know, a strong choice. It's not producer-led, it's not finance-led, although I do all those things. I come from an artistic background of a creation background. So one of the things that was really important for me is to create a space where artists can explore how to make great art using these tools to have that sort of research and development space which isn't leading directly to an outcome, which isn't bound to um, ticket sales or a format to begin with, but really allows them to flex their artistic muscles and explore what it is they want to do, what they want to say, and try and figure out how they create something that has artistic excellence and emotional resonance with audiences. So this is a project called We Humans Are Movement. These are just some screenshots of a project we did in mixed reality with um, a choreographer called Wayne McGregor. He's an extraordinary choreographer. Um, is, he's a resident, uh, he was actually the first contemporary choreographer that became a resident um, choreographer with the Royal Ballet. 
Um, his vocabulary has always been quite radical, mixing um, old with new. He's very interested in technology, has used a lot of technology on stage, a lot of projection, 3D projection. Um, but he was really interested in what it would mean for him as a choreographer to really create a choreography that was made to be, to be experienced in uh, mixed reality goggles. So this is putting something on your face, but you can, you can still see the world, but you can also see a digital layer. For him, there was something around, what does it mean to choreograph for a body that doesn't have to um, adhere to the laws of physics and the laws of biology? It can be anything. And what does it mean to be in an environment that can change very quickly? Um, the question is not so much in this, what becomes possible, sort of everything as possible. The question is, how is it ballet? What, is, what roots it in the human body? How do we connect to it? Where does beauty lie? Where do we recognize a body as a body? Where does it shift and how, if everything can change at any moment, how do we root it in an emotional response? How does it not just become shiny beauty? So we, so what you see here are different elements of that experiment. Um, and it really allowed him to develop a, an aesthetic and a, almost like a choreographic vocabulary that helps him develop what he wants to do next. So this, none of this has been seen in public, these slides. Um, this project is not public. This was really uh, a development because Wayne knew he would love to do something in the future where an audience is in a different environment than a stage environment, can see real dancers interact and mix with digital bodies and, and really it was an, an exploration of that. We think there's a show in the future, but this experimentation was really an artist development. And I think it's really important important to make sure that we provide spaces for our artists to become literate in, in these digital technologies in trying to push their personal stamp on it, their personal artistic vision and sort of wrestle with the materiality of it. So one of the things, for example, in this project that we started playing with was the sound of the body. So, you know, when um a ballet shoe hits the stage, there's a sound to it. And quite often in a big theater, you don't hear it. You have to be very close to the stage to hear it. And, and the illusion of lightness and lack of gravity is almost what we're aiming for. Where here we found we wanted to bring in breath and the sound of shoes and the scrape of the shoe on the stage because we wanted to root it in a reality. We wanted to, to have that, the viscerality of that body present. I think those are the kind of things that you can only learn and explore through doing. It's very hard to do this with just examples, with just talking about it. So it's artistic exploration, very, very key to what I think is important. So the second, the second thing that I really want to talk about is the idea of collaborative exploration. So when I started at uh, the Opera House, um, I knew I wanted to open up and do something very new with, with new voices. We wanted to do something that felt like it was rooted in opera tradition, but really sort of broke that apart and, and created a mix with different art forms. So my first port of call was Guap, which you see in the top left corner. It's a magazine from Southeast London. Uh, they come out of the grime and hip hop tradition. Um, they're amazing. They do film, they do video, they work quite often with big brands like Nike. Um, but what they've really become really great at is, is curating and, and, and keeping alive this amazing community of young, very diverse, um, artists and creatives on all different levels of their career that sort of congregate around their aesthetic. Um, I'd worked with them before, I love, I love their work. And when I was talking to Jide and Ibrahim who run the magazine, um, we were talking about the way hip hop and grime are 
poetry set in motion by music is music led both um, like opera, which is also poetry and music, uh, poetry set in motion by music. We felt there was a resonance there that we wanted to explore, but rather than deciding what, it, what the project was, we decided to have a lab where we brought together um, six of their creatives uh, from their community and six opera creatives, which are selected by the Opera House to play with technology and again, have that conversation, introduce people to new ideas, new ways of working, new ways, new possibilities. And then we developed a sort of mentoring program over several weeks in which the, uh, the groups that were sort of formed and the ideas that were formed within that workshop environment got developed further. One group and they, some of the groups then pitched those ideas to an industry panel and we have a small development grant for one of the groups. So what you see on the right hand side are Isabel Kettle, who is a, an opera director. She is um, directing, uh, a, she directed at the end of last year, Susanna on like a Royal Opera House stage. She very much comes out of that tradition. Ham in the middle is a uh, hip hop producer and um, visual artist. Um, and on the left is Math J, who is a creative technologist. Their idea uh, called Monkey Nation, which brought together um, a sort of Afrofuturist uh, uh, narrative around, a, a, uh, around climate change, won that development grant. And what we did then is find new partners to help them explore the idea further. So this is them, this picture is for them at the airport going to Copenhagen, uh, to the Copenhagen Film Festival, which has a lab to develop new ideas. I have a relationship with them. So we find them a spot there to develop the idea further. And this really beautiful world starts to emerge. We then um, found some funding and worked with, introduced them to a company called Visualize, where they started putting the world of Monkey Nation and the music, the three-dimensional music into an app that introduces you to the world of Monkey Nation um, and sort of creates a fusion between hip hop, hip hop linguistics and operatic music. It's really beautiful. What we're doing now, rather than keeping this in house, is we find them a new partner called Thinkfilm, who will take over this project. So Thinkfilm does a lot with um, impact. I think this team really knows who they want to talk to. They want to, it's not about bringing opera, it's about to young people, it's about engaging young people with climate change and using music and the power and the epicness of opera, which maps great onto climate change with sort of the, um, the rhythms and the uh, of uh, hip hop, merging that to really speak to an audience of the future. So we'll stay involved and we'll advise, but also we found them in essence new parents. So the projects will have a life beyond audience labs, beyond the opera house. And it really, for me, what's exciting about that is that we did this development, but it will go places. We don't need to own everything. We can be part of a chain of development and offer space and places, bring the art forms that we are so good at to projects that then can evolve, evolve in new ways. So we also, want to bring ambition to this, obviously. We don't want to just stay in that small space. We want to do big projects. So um, we are, <laughs> we have yet another date. We were about to open at the end of last year, um, but uh, pandemic. So it will now be late spring where we'll open Current Rising. So Current Rising is the world's first opera specifically created for hyper-reality. So hyper reality is, um, I like to talk about it as sort of quite premium VR. So what it is, is it allows people to wear VR goggles to so see a whole world that's created. But what we do is we create a set that they walk through. So you can touch things there. We play with um, wind and smell. Uh, you could play with water, with texture, with all of those things. At one point during this opera, an entire city grows from underneath your feet. Um, 
And because we can make the whole floor rumble, it just feels epic. So I encountered hyperreality for the first time when uh, I saw a Star Wars experience in it, which is delightful. It's very fun. You get to be a stormtrooper and you shoot other stormtroopers. It's great. At the end, Darth Vader comes. It's wonderful. It's very great entertainment. I've never experienced anything like being that immersed into anything. But for me, there was an immediate sort of sense of the operatic. It just feels operatic to be so deeply immersed, to have all your senses stimulated. It just felt epic. So this, for example, talking about the money. So uh, in the UK, there was a big funding round. Um, and in Canada, again, you see the investment as well from the government to really stimulate this these new technologies, and they're really excited when culture wants to be part of it. So here we had a, a, a funding, really big funding call called Audience of the Future, and we proposed making the world's first hyperreality opera. Now, this is the kind of funding call that the opera house normally wouldn't be part of at all. So again, it sort of opened up a new funding route to create something that was very ambitious. It is absolutely gorgeous. Um, I can refer you later if you want to. There's a lovely making of film on YouTube where you can get a real sense of the project a little bit more. That in itself is half an hour, so I don't have time to talk you through it. But it's it's basically this gorgeous installation. The picture you're looking at is uh, just looking into the installation, the physical installation that you walk into before you step into a digital world. Um, we worked with an all-female creative team, which in opera is unfortunately still um, way too rare. Um, but because it's part of new, you know, we wanted to make in new ways and with new voices, we wanted to do that from the start. It really maps onto Engender, which is a big um, push from the opera house to just open up um, the, the female quotient in, in our creatives. Um, I think what's really exciting and uh, so A, it's beautiful and I wish you could all come and see it, but B, it opens up uh, multitudes of new things. So we have now an, an opera that can tour and it can pop up in different places. This could pop up. We can build this in another opera house, but we could also build this in a shopping mall. We can build it outside. The, the footprint's about 10 by 15 meters. So it could, it could pop up in festivals. Um, and I think that that's a whole new universe for the, for the Opera House to think about how and where it can pop up in the world. I think the second thing that's super interesting is that our creative team, Nisha Jones, a very established opera director, uh, Joe Scotcher, um, Olivia award-winning designer, uh, Samantha Fernando, uh, award-winning composer, like they're all very good. And they all went on a journey of adjusting their process and opening up and experimenting with how they could bring their practice to this sort of extraordinary new project. The thing that's really exciting to me is not only that they step up and made something gorgeous, they also now speak about how they want to bring some of the things they did within this process back to their stage practice as well. Um, it's, so, so it really opens up a new creative stream, a new creative outlet, but also new creative ideas for the artists we work with. So for me, this project has just really does that thing of in combining the, um, like the ambition that we all have of doing sort of landmark projects that just push things forward, really we brought the rigor to the artistic process because we really wanted to create something that is has the same quality as we would bring to our main stage productions. So we had to really adapt the process and we took a lot of time in the beginning to work with our, our technology partner, Figment, who are, again, the SME in, um, in the UK, that are one of the few people that do hyper-reality. So they normally work in theme parks um, they're currently making a black mirror experience based on the TV show uh, for a big amusement park in the UK. They have made things for Orlando, Florida, for Harry Potter. They don't know opera. 
So what we did is really spend a lot of time letting those two creative processes meet each other and develop together. And next to that, we uh, put a, we're working together with a university to explore the different business models and the different uh, exploitation models that could underpin this kind of work. We can go deeper into this if you want to. So I think the third thing that's really opened up for us is that um, because so many things is po are possible, you can really work across disciplines. So first of all, we one of the first things I did was um, we'll do an experiment with the lovely people of Google. So what you see on the right hand side is a, um, a prototype of choreography specifically made by Krista McNally, who's um, an extraordinary dancer and choreographer for, from the Royal Ballet. And we wanted her to choreograph something specifically to be motion captured. Now, what you see on the right hand side is what we did with Google. The choreography is beautiful, but I think this isn't necessarily beautiful. Um, there's so much bad ballet going on there. It's not, it doesn't move your soul. The bodies weren't right. We didn't, we felt it was a, it was weaker than seeing the real thing. And what we really want to do is see technology as a way to go through, push through what's possible on stage and make something that could never, um, never uh, be performed on stage, something that leans into the possibilities. We thought this was almost like super interesting. And again, the digital literacy of, uh, of Kristen went up. We learned a lot about what was possible and not possible with motion capture and dancing bodies. Um, but it didn't lead to an end result we wanted to do something with. So this was an experiment, but not something we then put in the public domain. However, failure is not loss because you still own this. Rather than a live performance, you, it's, it's still there. The motion capture was still there. We still had the performers. So during the pandemic, I talked a lot with many of my colleagues um, in the UK in similar roles, including my colleagues at the National Gallery. And we decided to join forces and create the rules do not apply. So this is a picture, by the way, of Kristen during mocap, um, or, or her feet, obviously. Um, and we created an open call that really responded to the themes of Eve, um, which is all about remaking and reinventing and reimagining. And combine that with a Paula Rigo painting that they have, which has similar, um, similar themes, put that together and ask uh, artists and creatives to create a response to those two elements. We opened up the IP and the data in collaboration with Kristen of that motion capture and offered three micro commissions um, for three artists or creative teams to create a new piece of work that somehow lives between those two pieces, between the long history that the National Gallery has and the aesthetics and, and thinking about movement within ballet and create something completely new. So those micro commissions have now been awarded, they're in process. We have a, um, a a sort of radical digital collective from Germany, making something that touches on saints and sort of the medieval collection of the National Gallery and animates that with some of the movement that comes out of choreography. We have a visual artist from Nigeria who is creating a moving painting that's uh, very rooted in uh, the choreography of, of Eve, Kristen's choreography. And we have a um, a female uh, create, um, technolo creative technologist from the UK who is taking the choreography, putting it in a virtual environment and is playing with sort of the, the quantum, quantum mechanics really, and sort of breaking, if you break open the choreography, choreography again and again and multiply it in different spaces and, and exploring what it means to replicate and build upon. It's really exciting. 
And again, the National Gallery is not a natural partner for the Royal Opera House, despite them being a stone's throw away from each other. They had never worked together. Digital offers you the opportunity to look at new partners, not just from the technology realm, but also people who share ideas and want to go on the same journey as you, other cultural institutions, new kinds of artists, just opens up new collaborations. Then there is process because the world is our oyster. All of a sudden I'm doing a talk from, uh, from my room in, in the UK to Canada. And it means that we can think about geography and collaboration across geographies in a very new way. So um, just before I came here, we did a workshop with the Canadian Opera Company, the National Ballet of Canada, us, Sheridan and CERT. CERT is the Screen Industry Research and Training Centre in Canada. And what we've set up is um, a mentored process where uh, 15, no, sorry, 12 creatives get to explore different technologies, um, just learn it. It's almost like a, an artist development opportunity, which then results into the opportunity for those artists to connect with each other and either as an individual or as collectives from that pool to make a proposal for, again, a short commission where they push one of their ideas, make it into reality, work with the expert and the technology expertise of CERT to develop a piece of work that builds upon their existing practice, but allows them to explore how they might do that with technology. And that can take many shapes. So it could take be a live performance with uh, a digital backdrop that can do anything and everything to uh, one of the artists started talking about haptics immediately and, and how does it well, how does it work if the audience can literally feel the music? It again, this is about artistic literacy, about creating space for experimentation, but also doing that together. Um, so we're also um, within this process, really experimenting with how do we co-create when we can't be together? How can we open up co-creation across literally oceans in this case? Um, how do we what does that open up? How do we set up these collaborations? How can we do that in an environmentally sound way without all the traveling or with much less traveling? What does it mean to have, be able to have that contact continuously? How does someone direct something from the UK in a Canadian studio? So this is about process and about creating new connections between artists across borders and from different backgrounds as well. So again, we have a very diverse cast. We're really interested in sort of First Nation artists, Black artists, um, immigration stories, because it sort of feels like it maps this sort of onto the form. It's almost like the connection and the dialogue becomes part of what initiated, but also like what comes out of the process. So again, there's a lot possible, but here's some starting points that I think are really interesting when you start thinking about this. So I think um, identity, what is it that you're for? What is it that you're trying to do becomes more important in the digital space than anywhere else. So what is your mission? What drives you as an organization? Who do you want to be? Who do you want to be in dialogue with? What do you want to show? What do you want to explore? How do you want to, who do you want to reach? All of those questions are wrapped up in who you are and what you're for, the, what I would call the identity of the organization. Where in the sort of the building model, part of your identity is wrapped up in the building. Part of your identity is wrapped up in, in your geography, where you are. When you hit the digital sphere, those things can become, they're less apparent, they're less naturally there. So you can lean into them, but you can also lean away from them. You can become, I think it's really important that you know why you're doing these things because the digital landscape is wide and varied. So know who you are within it and make choices. It doesn't mean that you have to make choice about what that exactly looks like, but it does mean that it's really helpful if your choices come from you and your identity. 
it makes you recognizable, it makes you, it gives the work purpose. Money, very important. Um, so I think what's, I think a, a mistake I often see is that um, money comes first and often it's about trying to create a new income stream from new audiences. And I feel like that often becomes an obstacle to doing this work well. I think trying to find initially partners and investment from government, um, arts council, philanthropists to really explore and make sure you hit your identity, I think is really, really important and gives you a much stronger base to grow from than trying to uh, monetize through your audience immediately. Money is important, but I think the opportunity here is of dialogue and of the creation of work that speaks in new ways to new audiences or deepen the connection with existing audiences. And if money is the starting point, I think that sort of gets in the way. We can talk more about that. I think you have to think about it as programming. Don't leave it in the marketing department. It's also useful for marketing, but it's different from actually making it part of your building, making it part of the fabric of your art form, embedding it in your creative uh, departments, embedding it in how you think about how projects are initiated. Um, so again, I think the model that we're doing with Wayne is really interesting. It was a digital R&D that we held, but we know it is towards a show which will be part of the Royal Ballet program. And sort of that back and forth between digital spaces as R&D spaces, as presentational spaces, as spaces in which new ideas can grow, when they come back to stages, but also activating your foyer next to, um, you know, in a way that resonates with your main programming or using social media not just to tell people to buy tickets but to show work or to show experiments i think all of those things are really important when you go on the journey i always highly recommend to create space for yourself to pivot because you'll go on a journey and you think you know where you're going and actually quite often through doing because we're, we're trying to push the boundaries you realize that there are better opportunities if you pivot the project and pivoting with digital is really easy so make sure you've got that time and then finally contextualization with which i mean tell the story of why you're doing this tell the story of how you're doing it tell the story of the journey to your audiences because i think if you can text like this work is novel and that's exciting, but also sometimes hard to grasp. I think the more you can contextualize why you're doing it, how you're doing it, what excites you, bring the artists uh, into the dialogue you're having with your audiences, the richer this space can become for you as an organization or as a, an individual. And then finally, and this is something I'm really interested in at the moment, is the politics of it all. Um, there's a lot going on and there, you know, obviously I really enjoy working in this sphere. Um, it offers magic, theatrical magic, new possibilities, and all of that feels really exciting and rich and it opens up uh, opportunities to create more equitable access to the arts, more diverse artists, all of those things. But technology is also technology, and we all also understand that, you know, Google discuss, Amazon discuss, there is a lot going on. I personally feel that as the cultural sector, we need to take an active role in this sphere. I think the thing that we do really well is being aware of the civic role we have. How, what is the role of culture in society? How do we make it? a better, more equitable, more diverse space. Um, techno I often talk about technology, not just as a stage, but also as a public, as part of the public realm. News takes place there, dialogue takes place there. Often terrible <laughs> things happen. Um, you know, we all worry about the 
the echo the echo chambers, the bubbles, the sort of radicalization we see in there. What can we play a role in this? And how do we use art, creativity, and the civic role of culture to contribute to a better digital space? I think we should think about the ethics. Part of that is where we bring up <laughs> whose money we take. And sometimes um, I think one of the things I learned very much in this role is to say no to certain money. I am not here for other people's agendas. I'm not here to, uh, as a marketing department for a technology company. So it really needs, uh, personally, I feel that as cultural organizations, we really have a role in bringing ethics to this sphere, to really question the corporization, to really question if, if a technology company gives us money in return for our audience data, is that a good thing? You have to find your own ethics, like with all ethics, but I personally think it's not. I'm a big fan of open models, of sharing, of sharing amongst ourselves about how to do this better. Um, but also um, when I started working with the creative lab of Google, we, we told them how we were going to do IP and that the choreography IP would remain with our choreographer. And that sort of, that exchange of ethics, of models of different ways of working, I think we have something to offer to technology, to our audiences, to the world as that develops. I think diversity and inclusion are high on our agenda and that's not true for everyone who works in the development of new digital offerings, let's call it that. So I think there's, this is almost like a moral obligation of the cultural sector as we step into this field, as we step into this space to bring some of this thinking to it. So I really think that digital is an expression of and an exploration of your purpose. Who are you as, as an organization in relationship to other cultural organizations? Who do you want to talk to? Who do you want to platform? What do you want to show? What does excellence mean to you? What does uh, serving your audience mean to you? What are the kind of congregations you want to bring together within your digital realm? I think all of these are questions to explore. I think there is so much possible. I think we're just at the beginning of it. We've all been on fire in 2020. It feels like 2021 is a phoenix year. We've all thought harder and better about digital, but again, see it as the start of something because there is so much more to follow. Thank you. Thank you, Annette. Um, so many new thoughts there for us. Um, I'm going to welcome uh, Tateo Nakajima to the virtual stage here with Annette. And some of you will remember Tateo from earlier sessions. He is an Arab fellow and very much involved in the building of performance spaces, uh, spaces around the world. Um, and he's my go-to person for all my questions about acoustics and such. And Tateo and Annette have worked together on a number of things and we're delighted to have them to get together today um, to help us think about the future of our organizations. Um, so Tateo and Annette, I'm wondering if we could just talk a little bit about future art forms and how we begin the reimagining process of creating accessible art experiences. Do you want to go first to tell us you are new or no, should no, I? No, you, you should go first. Look, I think the thing that, there's two answers to that. One is nobody knows, and that's the true answer. I think what I'm really interested in at this point in time is is that idea of technology as a new stage, which means that we have a lot to offer. I do feel that um, the expertise of what it is to create an emotional experience for an audience that is present, but not next to you is really relevant to this space. So for me, it's about really trying to figure out with each project and getting one step closer to what do we want to keep of what we're already doing? What are we so extraordinary at? What do we not want to lose? And what is it that we want to shift? So if you, for example, look at Current Rising, 
um, the hyperreality opera I was talking about earlier. So at the very start of the process, we brought in the, the opera creative team into the studios of Figmund and they saw lots of VR, which was great. And they hated some of it and loved other bits of it. And we talked a lot about where they felt connected, where they felt disconnected. That became a theme of the opera almost, because that was a very strong experience where sometimes it, it felt alienating. Um, quite often, actually, when the VR tried to be like, do direct address, we were all like, ooh, it's a bit, it's a bit icky. Um, it's quite interesting that sometimes technology companies are really proud of things that we as artists go, ooh, no, please, because they're so excited that they're getting close to something and we're just going, oh, it's it's the valley of the uncanny. So we did that. And that really started giving us a vocabulary about technically what we found interesting. So we found transformation really interesting, for example. We found the shift of horizons, you know, the idea that you can be in a small space and then in a big space and how that maps onto music where, you know, containment and then explosion is 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 a rhythm so we find that but we also did the opposite where we talked about what we found fundamentally important about opera and look this is an opinion this is not that you know different people find but this team really hooked into the centralness of the human voice um, so voice became a really strong presence and how we treated voice within that world and how we could make that as human as possible um, became a really strong guideline as we were developing that piece. And I think I try and do that with all the pieces that I develop is to really try and figure out what we definitely don't wanna lose. What's, what is the guiding principle of the art form that we bring? Um, and what is what are the things that we want to explore changing because actually there's an opportunity here to, to push something. So for example, the horizons and transformation. So I think that when you start a project, I think it's as important what you want to keep than as what you want to change. And, and again, I think that's different for each project. I think that's different for different artists, but it's, there is a, I think what I would like to instill in, in all arts organizations is to have the confidence of what you're good at and not just trying to figure out how to use the technology, but sort of go, this is what we're about. This is what we want to do in this moment with this art form and make that central to the exploration, how that then translates to digital rather than trying to figure out what digital can do for your project. Does that make, it's, it's almost like a different fo focus point. So can I, can I, and I'd say, uh, I think that's right. But one of the things that struck me about the stories, uh, the examples you've given and the stories you tell is a reminder that actually none of our art forms were invented in a day. Yes. A constantly evolving tapestry. And um, I think that what is great about it is the, the creating the mind space and the continuity to try to try things. And I, and I think this is, uh, there, I see there is a question about institutional change. And I, I think that, uh, I think I, I wanted to ask you a question for which I think I know the answer, but I think it's interesting for everybody. But it could be inferred from your, what examples that you gave that you were given a massive budget. Oh yeah, no, I didn't have any budget. Well, I've had a tiny budget. And I think this is this is quite interesting is that one has the impression that to do really exciting things, you have to have a big budget. And I think uh, it'd be interesting to talk about that because you, you talked about politics, you talk, we talk, you, you in, in imply that there are some fundamental changes that evolution always brings to organizations, right? And how does that, how have you experienced that process, I think, of evolution? from where you are at, at a leading edge of it in your organization? Uh, so I, I'm just gonna separate out money from organizational culture for a moment. So we'll get to money. So when I started at the Opera House, I had a, for some organizations a big budget within the context of the Opera House, it's, I had 12,000 pounds a year. That was my budget. Um, so percentage wise, that is uh, of the Opera House very little, and you can do it with much less if you need to. So we'll get to the money. I think 
organizational change is interesting. I, obviously, I work for a massive organization, and I think there are two elements that one can think about. So one is uh, the organizational structure. So what we often find, especially in, um, you know, economically strapped organizations, and I think everyone is in the, in, in the cultural sector, is that we've sort of, we know how we do things, there is very little flex to do things differently because, because that is costly. So one of the things that we're trying to figure out with, um, with the audience labs within the opera house is how do you create space for doing things differently? So how do you use the fact that there is a well-oiled machine to your advantage and when mm -hmm. does it get in the way? So, and that's, I think what's been really exciting about my job is that has meant things about contracting and IP. It has, it has meant things about how finance is set up. And so, so I touch on lots of different um, uh, departments within the organization because all of it sort of is involved. I had a wonderful time talking to one of our, our stage masters when we did the first um, motion capture with Kristen and Google. All of a sudden we needed to think about the floor of a motion capture studio and we really just figured out a way to have like a dance floor but not hyper expensive and what we could do and what that would mean mm -hmm. for the choreography so so you know and that was an in-depth he's still my favorite guy paul duffy master of all things floor at the royal opera house so we made that part of the organization so mark dakin who is our extraordinary uh technical head, um, he talks often about lumpy production. How do we make our production not so streamlined that there is space for things to happen differently? Mm. And how do we use this kind of work, which is sort of at the extreme end of that, to create more space also for new companies to come in and make work in a slightly different way? Like we did a, a, a ballet show in the Limbury which worked with Kanduka, which is a company that is um, led by and populated by a disabled artists and disabled dancers. Mm -hmm. The opera house is weirdly not always set up to be, to be responsive because it's such a well-known machine. So using this work to create more lumpiness, as Mark calls it, I love that expression and I'm adopting it, um, to, to think about production as lumpier and, and create uh, more space for things to be done differently in response to different artists' needs and different artistic ideas. I think with this work can really help that organizational change. And it's it's long, it's a long hard road. I'm not I'm not saying that in three years we've made massive organizational change, but it's almost that we start to point towards a different way of thinking rather mm -hmm. than having new solutions. So I have to. Um... I have to guess, Annette, that there was a willingness, at least in the beginning, and an openness. Um, do you ever feel like the company looks at you and goes, here she goes again. She's going to ask us to do oh, something all the time. That, that's going to cost money. Um, but so, so one of the things is, and back to the money, I don't cost very much money. And this is part like, I think exploration, experimentation is best done in partnership. And I think new kinds of partnerships attract new money. So I'm very conscious to not can, can, what I would call cannibalize any of the sort of finances that support the stage. So what I do is attract new kinds of funding. Um, you know, when, when we work with Google, they pay, they pay for everything. Um, and that's, that's, you know, I can, ha I have very open conversations about money all the time, because it's really important. And it's really important that if we talk about digital as an expansion of our stages, that we don't cannibalize our stages while, while we're at it. Yeah. I think there's an interesting question about the word expansion, because as I was listening to you, uh, I feel that there is a lot about what we need to do, which is actually goes beyond expansion to evolution. Mm. The whole concept that it's not just about putting the things we're doing on more platforms. It's actually about an evolution of what we're doing without it being a pandering to what we think is necessary. It's really about, to, to gain audiences, it's really about rethinking from the ground up once again, as one does periodically, what we're doing. Mm. 
Can yeah, you, uh, share, I think it's really interesting. Um, can you share why the, 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 your, your team was called Audience Labs? No, let's say technology lab or uh, it's it's my my genius ex boss the lovely um, uh, Lucy Sinclair um, and I think for me I was I was attracted to the job because they didn't put digital in the role um, they were really they wanted to establish something that was about connecting to audiences and the labs is very much about the experimentation so i think lucy's really lucy came out of uh the bbc and was really interested in audience-centric design and some of those design methodologies i talked about is that how do people experience things is as important as what we want to say because because we understand the stage but we might not understand vr or ar or 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 uh, smart stages or all of those things. So we wanted to really focus on how it connected us to audiences as much as we never wanted it to be about tech. And it's yeah. really interesting. I'm one of the few people in my job in the UK, like there's, there's equivalent and all of them are slightly different and have different approaches. I'm one of the few people who don't have digital in their role, in their mm -hmm. role name. I love that. It's not always the most useful thing in conferences, but overall, I love it because it really communicates something about where we're coming from. We're coming out of experimentation, the art, and the emotion that art can bring and the transcendence that art can bring to our audiences. I think it might be interesting for the audience to also hear that, you know, one of the first things that you and I worked on as part of Audience Labs was actually looking at what it is at the core of what defines opera. Mm -hmm. and we, 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 we believed that there was, um, as an art form, very stuck on the theater as, as it is developed over hundreds of years, literally. And how do you, if you take that out of the theater, what do you need to retain for it to really be opera? And I think that sort of thinking process is really quite interesting for all our art forms to think mm -hmm. about what's essential and what's habit, what's yeah. form and what actually is at the core of it. And I think some of what we came out with had really to do with your emotional response as much as anything else. And, yeah, and I think so. I hop in here because um, I know that we've got some questions that have been coming in in chat. And I would like to say to the audience listening that we would like to open the floor for your thoughts um, and questions. And I'm going to ask uh, my colleague, Anne-Marie Switzer, um, musical creativity coordinator, to come on and just um, share with us what the questions are. So Anne-Marie, would you like to share what you're seeing? Sure. I think uh, Robert has a great question that's actually spinning off of what you were just talking about. So um, he's asking, the pandemic accelerated the exploration of digital, but what potential pivots will we face post-pandemic? So thinking into the future here with the hyper-physical socialization and new normal that's going to occur. <laughs> Good question. Lots of long words in that. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great question. Um, look, I think I think there's two things that happened in the pandemic, right? We we all all of a sudden realized that now we're locked in our rooms, we want to be connected to each other. So I think there will happen two things will happen. We'll all flock like there's no tomorrow back to our spaces to hang out together and to have visceral physical experiences again. So that's really wonderful. I think the other thing that has happened is that the um, the People have had to experiment with how to connect when they can't be together, how to have experiences that make life worthwhile within the, to be honest, extreme tediousness or, you know, worse in the pandemic. So we, what we've seen is, a, is a, an openness of audiences and also a growing audience literacy and a willingness to engage with this kind of work, which is, to be honest, unprecedented in the time that I've been working in this, which is, you know, 15 years now. Um, so I think there's two things happening. Um, some of it, some of it will just be like, can we go, can we, can we have that thing again that we love so much? But there's also um, a change in behavior in uh, knowing that things can be done differently. I use the example of my, my beloved mother who did, um, uh, who did an, online escape room with her friends. Now my mother in an escape room and my mother doing something social online would, would I don't think I thought I would see. 
and that just happened. Now, I don't think that post pandemic, my mother will do another online escape room with her friends ever again. But the there has show. been so something has been opened up. And I think I think um, my mother will definitely be more open to experience the things she already loves in new ways, especially if they are social, especially if she feels connect more connected to to art forms, organizations, things she already loves, especially if that means that she can do something with me, her beloved daughter, I'm from the Netherlands, so, so we are geographically apart. And all of a sudden having experiences with people who are geographically apart is something like right now, we're much more accustomed to, and that opens up new things for our audiences and new things for us. Can I add to that, that um, for some of what we've been thinking in the post-pandemic sense, um, is that some of the issues that we're facing are not new, they're just accentuated. And one of the ones that I think have not been talked about enough is that the evolution of cities, which fundamentally are more sustainable and, and more effective, more innovating um, inventions, I'm gonna call it, are also terribly isolating and actually socially, socially challenging. And I think we, uh, it's, it's well documented that we live globally live in a pandemic actually of loneliness. And I was highly inspired by an arts organization uh, in Denmark recently uh, that we work with who's, who sees their primary mission not as delivering cultural product in any way or form, their primary mission is to combat loneliness, societal loneliness in their community. And I think this is, this is something to think about because I do think that a lot of digital experience is inherently limited, better than, better than not, and the opportunities are good, but there is an inherent tendency towards singularity. And I think that some of the exciting things that, uh, that you're doing, Annette, and, and the most exciting discussions that uh, we've seen really have to do with those experiences that go back to the core mission of bringing people together. Yeah, as opposed to delivering things in a way that allows people necessarily to experience them in a singularitic way. Yeah, I think, and I think there are choices to be made there. Um, so, so I talk a lot about shared experience because I think we're good at it, right? We, we, we're theatre makers. We know what a shared experience feels like. We know what it does when there's a collective in-breath from yeah. the audience. That's sort of yeah. what we're going for here. Um, so all everything we've made except in one exclusion is monkey nation but i'll come to why which is the afrofuturist ar project um is a shared experience and we've just made that just core to the choices we make and how we develop projects so that it's always a shared experience look it's arbitrary we we could not have that rule but giving yourselves some sort of guidelines of what you're about um, I love the, uh, we're here to combat loneliness. It's, and that sort of feeds into that thing I was talking about earlier about what is your identity and how does that, well, how does digital allow you to do that more and be more yourself, then how does it take away from that? Yeah. So, yeah, I'll leave it at that. That's such a poignant way of putting it. And uh, I, I like that that is their identity, the pandemic of loneliness. Um, uh, yeah, uh, so beautiful. Another question from Ottilie from our chat is, uh, she said, my main takeaway from shows at the Royal Opera House is the value placed in craft craftsmanship. Um, so how can we offer practitioners of newer technologies, digital tools, that same recognition? I mean, I sometimes talk about the mantle of expertise. So what I try to do when I start a new project and I introduce new people to each other, I, I try and give the different people with a different expertise, the mantle of expertise and, and sort of try to encourage um, people to learn about what, what each other's crafts are. And it's not, I like, have no uh, interest in um, my art is becoming good technologist, but it is, sometimes it's just about translation. Um, so for example, Joe, who is the designer of the uh, hyper-reality opera, we, we really uh, worked with her 
on how to work with the CGI artists. So those are in essence, what I would call the scenic painters within VR. And we set up a sort of a trajectory about an, of exchange so that she understood a little bit more about what paints they use and what the limitations and what the possibilities were so that they could work together creatively and work together to a vision rather than a continuous sort of um, uh, bashing. And I think, I think the thing is it takes time and I try and build up as much time as possible within each project and we all know time is money but but I think it's really important because um, I don't think there is a shortcut to craftsmanship and it's not a shortcut to understanding the craft enough to have a dialogue about it um, so oh, that, it doesn't cool. need much but it needs a little and it needs that time I would add uh, to it that actually we're not very good at it necessarily in the arts generally. When we live in a post listian world in music, for example, where that you know, figure at the piano is the only thing you're interested in, maybe the figure who's standing in front of the orchestra is the only thing that you're interested in. And you, know, you, you have a playbill that actually says the conductor's name and, and then everybody else suddenly becomes anonymous. And at best you have the, uh, the members of the orchestra uh, printed in a book somewhere. But I think that there is a, there is a, and, and you know, good ensembles and good organizations create better connection with their communities by celebrating the different musicians and creating different levels of interaction with the community. But most orchestras, I think, do not celebrate the lighting technician, and they call him a technician, not an artist. They don't celebrate the the the, uh, the people who actually know how exactly an orchestra wants to sit, despite the fact that actually in some places. They're the highest people, highest paid people around because their knowledge is so rare, rarer than the conductors. And I think, I don't think as an industry we're as good as we should be of any of those our art artistic contributors that we have to to the outcome as we should be. And then uh, when it comes to digital, I think we just have to continue to learn. So I think that time you talk about Annette has to be also time that's shared, an interest that's shared, a curiosity that's shared through various channels, digital, why not, you know, um, with our audiences as well. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point because I think you, you are right, like the, the bills and who gets recognized on it is really important. Um, and simultaneously, there is a lot of hidden crop. The wig makers at the Opera House are just extraordinary. We have an, an in-house blacksmith who is extraordinary and not always publicly recognized, but internally very highly valued. And I think, again, I think with this work, maybe we can we can move some of those. Uh, well, cinema those... does it better, doesn't it? I mean, I'm, I'm one of these people who actually was, stays and, and watches all the credits. And, and these days, the, the not, it's fascinating to see the, the implications on the creative process if you actually watch the number of teams, especially in CGI and animation, how many different teams are involved and every one of them, their names are listed. And, you know, we don't do that in, in all of our art forms. It's, it's, it's sad, actually. That's maybe something we could learn. Mm. Yeah, there's some deeper roots there, hey? Um... I, I appreciate those answers. I think uh, for the kind of final question here in the last few minutes, uh, Annette, perhaps you could speak to um, these audience labs that you refer to throughout your presentation. And um, you mentioned that a lot of them haven't gone public, but if any of them have and how audiences have indeed responded to them. Um, uh, oh God, it's so project specific. Um, so, so what we're finding is that um, our work, we're quite cutting edge. So what we're finding is that, and what's exciting to us is that a lot of our audience is completely new to the art form. And that's really exciting because they go, oh, this sounds cool. And it happens to be opera rather than that we get like a lot of diligent opera people. Um, so, so for us, that's been really exciting. We've, we've been very artist driven and then, then connecting that to audiences. Um, but, uh, sorry, there's a, pa a pet trying to get through a door. Um, uh, but so, so what we're finding is that we're connecting to new audiences and what we're trying to do is figure is, is learn how we connect those 
back to the art form and how we almost create pipelines from that work into um, the programming in the Limbury and on the main stage and what that could mean. I think we're at the early stages of it. What I'm really excited about and is something to look out for is that we've now, uh, we're now working with the university to do actually a more in-depth audience research specifically on the hyperreality opera which I was hoping to share with you now but will now open May um, so we'll we'll publicize a report about I'll buy that. yet another ticket for it oh, don't get me started um love a pandemic but I think I think what we're finding is that the 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 in of the new formats really speak to new audiences and there's a whole audience that is sort of interested in having cultural experiences who don't associate themselves as a traditional uh, art audience. And I think for, for us, that's really exciting, you know, especially with a building like a Royal Opera House, which is gorgeous and beautiful, but obviously also is intimidating to a lot of audiences. I often talk about you know, the building I work in has a very, very high threshold. Being able to step over it is a thing in its own right. So, so we're particularly looking at that, that dimension. Well, I think we are going to stop there because we are um, nearing our finishing time. And I would like to say a huge thank you to you, Annette, for sharing your work and to Teo for um, in joining in in this conversation. I'm feeling inspired by the thinking and the creativity and also your assurance that it doesn't have to cost a lot of money. And I think one of the things that we let stop ourselves in the process is limitations, limiting, limiting our, our thinking from the outset. And so um, I hope we can all keep that in mind. And I also think back to your uh, thoughts around collaborating and reaching out to new partners and being willing to have new processes for what we do. Um, I think there's a huge challenge in that and huge opportunity. So thank you both so much for being with us. And um, I would just like to say to all of the people online, this is our last session. And so our last time together for this symposium I have learned a lot and I have appreciated that we've had such a high quality of conversations. And I hope that these conversations will continue on in your workspaces. Um, and maybe we should set up some sort of a post symposium chat for ongoing conversations. And certainly I know within our own city here, um, we already feel that there are so many opportunities to collaborate and start experimenting. Um, you are going to, by the end of the week, receive a survey. We would love you to fill it in. It helps us understand what we've done well and what we could improve upon. Um, and in closing, I just want to say to everyone, stay safe, stay healthy, stay warm. And thank you again for taking the time to be with us at the Digital Symposium here. Thanks.